Well, thank you very much, Ingrid, and thank you for the invitation to be here um, and to talk to you a little bit about some of the work uh, which largely sits within a, a project called Legume Futures, which is a, an EU FP7 project in which uh, SLU are, are a partner to, and Joran here is uh, looking after the, the SLU end of this. Um, I was invited to go to Brussels on Tuesday by uh, the Green Alliance, who are interested in influencing the greening measures of the common agricultural policy. And they wanted someone to come there and talk to them about using crop rotations and using legumes and the value of that to European agriculture. So that's the, the background of uh, where I'm going today. I should say I am a, not an economist, I'm not a policy specialist, I'm a soil scientist. Um, so I will try and explain to you my view of what is going on in terms of the greening measures of the CAP. I'll start off with a little bit of background to that because I think perhaps some of you are as unfamiliar as I was a few weeks ago with uh, what is going on in terms of policy. Just to put the whole thing in context, we're all aware of the challenges that the world faces in terms of, of global food security. Uh, and about how we match uh, supply and demand of food and how we do so in ways that are sustainable. How do we ensure that people don't go hungry? These, these are massive challenges for the world. Um, and one of the issues about uh, the common agricultural policy and its reform is what is the right thing for Europe to do? How, how should agricultural policy be changing in Europe and how can it support some of the global issues around food security? As I'm sure uh, most of you are aware, there, there are currently uh, two pillars in the CAP which are going to be maintained. Pillar one is, is the one about direct payment to farmers and about market measures. Um, and the second pillar is about rural development. Uh, and I'm going to concentrate today on telling you a little bit about pillar one uh, and what is called the greening of the CAP. So I've just, just put some background uh, here on this slide. To say, concentrating on, on, on pillar one, the objectives of that are about viable food production, they're about climate action, and they're about protecting and enhancing Europe's natural resources. And the way that that support works is in terms of direct payment to farmers. Um, so what are the proposed changes? Well, we're looking at 30% uh, of, the, of the funding for pillar one being spent on what are called greening measures. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, there are also uh, new standards for cr cross-compliance, and, and cross-compliance is about uh, adhering to various sort of statutory policies, uh, things like good agriculture and environmental condition and uh, things like animal welfare. Um, so say I'm going to concentrate on, on the greening measures. Um, what are those? Um, well, I'm, I'm using a, a, a report that was put together by some, some Dutch colleagues, um, and there are three, three main issues here. Uh, one is about crop diversification. One is about maintaining permanent grassland. And the third is about an ecological focus area on farms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to concentrate on the first one of these. I'm going to talk to you about the crop diversification measures. And what the aim of these is uh, improving biodiversity, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and about uh, improving the resilience of our soils and also our ecosystems. So within the, the reform proposals, uh, the description of crop diversification is at least three different crops. So what that means is that uh, any farmer would have to grow three different crops on his farm. But those crops could be uh, wheat, oats, and barley. There's no there's, no, uh, there's nothing in the proposals at the moment about crop groups or crop families or indeed crop rotations, and we'll come on and talk about that. Uh, so the proposal is three, three different crop groups. And I think if we think where, where this is going, um, if a, a reform of the cap is actually going to change European agriculture, then we need to have proposals that we would say have teeth um, you know, proposals that, that will, have, will have a change and have an effect. And there was a study done last year showing that uh, actually most arable farmers already grow three different crops. They might only be wheat, oats and barley, they might be three cereal crops, um, but most farmers actually already grow three crops. And 
if that was to become part of CAP, that would only actually have an effect on 2% of the arable area. So, you know, you can say that that proposal really is not going to make any difference. And so this is where um, some of the, the, the elements in the Parliament uh, are trying to change uh, these proposals to something that would make more difference. I think we need to be very clear here whether we're talking about spatial diversification, so people simply growing uh, different crops in different fields, or the idea of, of a crop rotation and of the benefits that, that comes with that, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So I think if, if it was to move to a change to requiring three crop groups, uh, so it might be cereals, uh, oil seeds, and protein crops, then you start to be able to think about uh, making a very big difference to European agriculture. I think anyone who studied agriculture in, in school, in college, uh, probably knows what a crop rotation is about, um, and is probably uh, well aware that the advantages of crop rotations have uh, been known for a very long time. The Romans knew about crop rotations, the Chinese claim the Chinese invented crop rotation, um, but I think, you know, uh, that there is a mass of evidence from history on the benefits of rotating crops on the same, uh, on the same piece of land. But if you look at uh, agriculture in Europe and how it's changed uh, since the Second World War, then there's very much been a move away from traditional rotations to uh, shortened or, or more simplified rotations as, as a result of the, the wide availability and the cheap availability of both fertilizers and, and pesticides. I think where, where we do see rotation still is much more common in, uh, for, for, for example, uh, in, in organic farming. And obviously, the, the choice of crops in a rotation is, is uh, not simply a, a case of deciding what it might be nice and what would have good effects grown in a rotation, but clearly the market, there are market forces there, there are soil constraints there, um, and there are terrific interactions between the kind of crops you can grow in a rotation and the availability of things like machinery and, and tillage and whether you are or aren't using fertilizers. So there's, there's a lot of options there. Um, and, you know, well known for a, a very long time that, that rotations can have uh, an impact on a, on a very wide range of what we now call ecosystem services. Um, so the idea of being able to use legumes within a crop rotation to fix nitrogen, about alternating crops with uh, planted at different times of year or that have sort of different structures above the ground and below the ground so they're providing uh, hosts for biodiversity, uh, crops that have different susceptibilities to, to pests and diseases. There's, there's a whole range of, of options in, in designing a crop rotation. Um, and uh, you know, a, a number of those options will have a, have a significant effect on what goes on in the soil. Um, on uh, not only on sequestering carbon, but on uh, the development of a, of a good soil structure. And, and uh, if, if the soil structure is right, that's half the battle in terms of getting, uh, getting a good crop yield, as I'm sure you in this room are all uh, very, very well aware. So, you know, a rotation is not about uh, being completely prescriptive about what anybody should do in terms of crops. And I don't think anyone is thinking about that in the cap reform. There's no, there's no idea here of actually trying to uh, really influence exactly what people will do, because by doing that, you, you, you start to interfere with, with trade issues. Um, I don't, I'm not really anticipating anybody's going to take in all the detail of this, of this slide at all. But I think the idea here is just simply to say that um, with these rotations, you know, you, you, can, uh, you can have a fixed rotation which always does the same thing and always comes back, uh, you know, a series of years after years. Or there are many, you know, different ways of looking at this. There are many ways of being flexible, but of having a pattern or a, a crop sequence going on. And there's, you know, there's, there's plenty of, uh, of literature about that. And I think the slides will be, be made available if people want to. To, uh, to look at this in, in more detail. But really the point is here that you know, rotations do allow flexibility. It's not a prescriptive system. And this is just a, a photograph from uh, the northeast of Scotland. Uh, this is a, a crop rotation uh, trial on, on organic farming, which was established 21 years ago. Um, but just showing a landscape where rotation is still very much a part of the tradition, in part because... Uh, the land isn't particularly good for arable crops. The climate is uh, 
not the nicest climate in the world, um, although we like it. Um, but here, you know, you can see the kind of landscape that you get with that mixture of pasture, of uh, dairy production, of sheep production, uh, and also of, of arable crop production. Of course, one question that people are always asking is, well, you know, what, are the, what are the economic consequences of a crop rotation? And uh, if we look back at the, um, the data available on that, it's something that I, I find it quite hard to, to, to look at in a historical sense, because prices are always changing, the market price of crops is always changing, the price of the inputs is changing. But I think when we think about rotations, what we have to consider is, is looking at, at a whole period of time, not, not looking at individual crops, but looking at what happens uh, over the period of the rotation. Um, and the idea that when you look at it like that, um, the, the system costs can be reduced over time because it might be possible through the use of legumes to reduce the amount of fertilizer, or it might be possible because of being, having a better ability to control weeds or to control pests and diseases. To, to reduce costs. So there are, there are lots of aspects of it. Um, and uh, you know, in, in organic systems, for, for example, you might have to accept that there may be crops which, or there may be years in the rotation where there may not be a crop product to sell, but that you need that uh, like a, a fertility building course in the rotation. So there's, you know, there's, I, I'm not an economist, but there are obviously really interesting things to consider here in terms of, of, of moving towards a more rotational system. I just want to show you a, a couple of examples. Uh, this is from a, a colleague, Ron Stobart, in, in the Arable Group in, in the UK, where he looked at uh, growing oilseed rape um, at different frequencies within a crop rotation. Um, and what you see here is that uh, the highest yield here is the first oilseed rape. So you have a field where it's never, never grown oilseed rape before. Um, you see the maximum yield there. Um, and as you move from oilseed rate one year in three, uh, alternating oilseed rape crops to continuous oilseed rape, you see a decline in the production of rape. Um, they can't explain it uh, using uh, anything that's going on above the ground. They can't explain it in terms of uh, any above ground pests and diseases so far. This is an ongoing piece of research. Uh, but they're now looking at below ground pathogens that wouldn't normally be associated with oilseed rape. So there's an interesting, uh, there's an interesting story there, but that's you know, ju just an example of the impact of rotation design. Um, another example on, in terms of uh, tr using a rotation to, to manage weeds, um, back in 1938, rotation of crops is the most effective means yet devised for keeping the land free from weeds. Um, weeds, of course, live in, in ecological niches. They're looking for that opportunity, which might be the right amount of bare ground or the right amount of light or moisture, um, to actually exploit that niche and grow. So if you're growing crops that have different amounts of ground cover at different times a year, uh, a mixture of uh, some, perhaps some permanent crops or um, perennial crops and some arable crops, then you start to to, to change the flora that, that can survive, and, and things like row crops, so potatoes, for instance, uh, terrific uh, ability to kind of clear the, the field of weeds. And of course, weeds aren't all bad. Weeds have a, a significant uh, biodiversity value and, and work as things like green bridges for maintaining mycorrhizal populations in soil. So we don't want to eliminate all the weeds, but rotations certainly have a, a value for weed management. And this is just an example from actually some American work showing that uh, if you have a rotation with different lengths of alfalfa cropping, then uh, after three years, the one in the middle, <coughs> oops, sorry, uh, the one in the middle there, um, you get uh, the, the best effect in terms of seedling density. I've stopped moving around, don't I? <laughs> so, We've talked a little bit about some of the agronomic effects of, of rotations and what the benefits of uh, including rotations in, in, the, in the cap reform proposals might bring. One of the really major issues for, for Europe is, is, is the nitrogen story um, and the reliance of European agriculture on uh, buying protein from places like South America. So I thought I'd just, just show you a few of the, the facts and figures and tell you some of that story. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the European Nitrogen Assessment, which has recently been published. 
So what you can see here is um, on the left, um, the, uh, the nitrogen cycle as it might have been in 1900 had we had the EU27 in 1900. Obviously, we didn't. But this is, this is, this is what modelling does for you. Um, and then on the right, uh, you can see the, the nitrogen story for um, around 2000 model for the EU27. And I mean, perhaps the most obvious thing in that diagram is the many larger fluxes, the big, the big blue uh, and yellow fluxes in the right-hand diagram um, associated with manufacture of fertilizer, use of fertilizer, um, import of food and feed from outside the EU, and obviously, importantly, things like the increase in, in greenhouse gas emissions. And that, the European nitrogen assessment is available on the web um, and a tremendous source of you know, up-to-date up information on what's going on with, with the, the, the nitrogen cycle. If we look at fertilizer use, uh, if you look at European fertilizer use since the 1960s, which is about, of course, when uh, we, we saw sort of uh, uh, agricultural reforms coming in in Europe, um, we can kind of be a little bit proud of ourselves and say, oh, look, it's going down in, fertilizer use is going down in Europe since, uh, since the mid-1980s. This is a good thing, isn't it? But then if you look at the line above, you look at the red line, what's going on in developing countries, uh, we see uh, an increasing pattern of fertilizer use. And some of that fertilizer is fueling Europe. Some of that fertilizer is being used to provide crops which are being imported into Europe. So we have to take, I think, some responsibility for that world increase. Um, and that really is quite a high slope, that top line, that, that world line. Dietary habits in Europe and other parts of the world have, have changed distinctly over, over recent years. People are eating more meat. Uh, animals require protein. And it has been very cheap, um, at least until now, to, uh, to import protein from places like South America. And you can see uh, on the left-hand side in the FAO data that very strong increase in both the beans themselves uh, and in soy cake coming in. And if you look at the, the other diagram uh, behind me on, the, on, the, on your right, you can look at that in terms of the amount of arable land that we are dependent on outside of the European Union to produce food. So you can look at it in terms of thousands of tons of soya bean, but actually it's somehow, I think it's a little bit easier, rather than trying to visualize what thousands of tons of soya bean look like, it's actually slightly easier to, to, to put in your mind's eye uh, what thousands of hectares of land look like. Um, and you can see that uh, you know, w w if you look at the net balance between arable land we're importing and exporting, uh, then there's about uh, 35,000, 35 million hectares there. Have I got the numbers right? Probably not. Uh, anyway, uh, what we're doing is we're looking at, uh, at exporting carbohydrate because many, we're actually good at growing carbohydrate in Europe. We're good at growing uh, cereals and, and, and starchy materials. Um, and what we're doing is we're importing protein. So there's a, there's a balance there in terms of uh, massive import of protein. And you can, you know, that, that reflects, if you look at the, the livestock density in the EU, uh, you see that we're, we're getting a separation between areas uh, producing livestock and areas producing crops, um, and uh, the protein's got to come from somewhere to feed all those animals. As I said, dietary habits are, are changing. Um, this just shows, this is a slide of, of uh, Ian Givens from the University of Reading, um, showing how the protein intake in, in different products varies in, in different parts of Europe. Uh, but very, you know, if you look up there at, at Poland, of sort of uh, over 40% of their dietary protein intake is coming from, from meat. Uh, and the middle, the middle bar showing Finland very high in terms of, uh, of, of dairy produce, of, of milk. But uh, you know, this is one of the di dietary change is one of the things fueling these changes in the amount of uh, protein we're importing. Now, you might think, we need more protein, we must be growing more protein. Well, it's not what the statistics show. Uh, this shows the decrease in uh, area of uh, peas and beans uh, since the 1960s. 
Um, and if you look at forage crops, I'm showing you peas, showing you peas and beans here. But uh, if you look at the story for, for forage legumes, then you see uh, a decline in that as well. And it's not like we can't actually grow these crops. We can grow these crops if it's economically viable to do so. Um, I shall show you a, a couple of examples of, of legumes in, in crop rotations. Um, the biggest benefit, potentially, is their ability to fix atmospheric nitrogen and reduce nitrogen use. They're diversifying the crop system, different crop families, and the beneficial effects on yield. Um, so a whole variety of, of legume crops we can grow very well here, um, though I have to admit that the uh, that's actually soybean being grown in Brazil because I didn't have any nice pictures of European soybean. Um, but you can see the, the cow grazing, the forage, um, and then obviously the, the peas and beans. And you know, as, as you all know, these crops look different below ground as well. You can see the above ground part in the previous photograph being you know, very, uh, very popular in terms of biodiversity. You can see why, why uh, insects might be attracted to those plants. So we're looking at... Uh, the, these, the, the legume plants where you've got this uh, symbiotic relationship going on in the roots and, and uh, atmospheric nitrogen benefiting the plant. Within the, the Legume Futures project, we have a whole series of, of sites across Europe, uh, some, uh, some organic sites, uh, some conventional sites, but really ranging north to south and east to west across Europe. Well, you might uh, recognize uh, this place. Um, and some work from uh, the Department of Crop Production Ecology here, uh, looking at the impact of uh, crop sequence on uh, the production and, and quality of, of cereals. And here we can see some, some results showing uh, the impact of having uh, different rotations on winter wheat yields. I mean, the, the data are, are quite noisy, but uh, that top line up there, is uh, showing that where you're growing winter wheat uh, after uh, a mixture of clover and grass as opposed to grass or a rotation without, without a grass component, then you're seeing the, the greater yields coming out of the, the grass and clover. Let's whiz down to southern Europe, quick nip down into Spain to the University of Cordoba, um, again part of the same project. Um, and we're seeing, if you like, a similar story here. Um, what this shows is, uh, again, we're talking about wheat grain yield, and we're talking about wheat yield after uh, a series of uh, either legume crops, so chickpea and faba bean, or uh, non-legumes, so there's wheat and, and sunflower. Um, and what you see is that the, the grain yields are, are greatest after the legumes, and here the relationship with nitrogen fertilizer. So we're not, in this case, not talking about organic systems using legumes, we're talking about conventional farming. Uh, using legumes, and uh, what you can see from the, the faba bean line is that after perhaps 80 or 90 kilograms of M per hectare, you're starting to see the yield advantage flattening off uh, because of the impact of, of the nitrogen that's being fixed. So trying to sort of draw this towards a, a conclusion, um, wh where do, do rotations and legumes fit into the, the CAP uh, 2013 proposals? I hope I've given you a little bit of an overview of what, what, what CAP is trying to achieve, um, what rotations can potentially do. Um, it's been a bit of a superficial look, but I think there's probably uh, lots of areas of interest and lots of areas of expertise in the audience. Um, and uh, what, you know, the, the, the potential role of legumes and the fact that we could grow more legumes and we could help to uh, stem this flow of, of, of imported nitrogen from outside of Europe. The, uh, the commissioner talks about we need nothing less than a CAP that respects soil and water and promotes practices that use them in a sustainable and resource efficient way. And they talk about a profound greening of the CAP and a need to actually have uh, a reform that will change future agriculture. Um, but are we going to get that? Well, I think what we've talked about today talks about diversifying cropping. Um, but the value of having longer crop rotations, of having a range of different crop families as opposed to single crops in there, um, there are benefits to crop sequences rather than simply changing species. We don't have to be talking here about radical changes to agriculture. 
We're not suggesting, I think, that people completely change their production systems, the crops they grow, the livestock they produce, or the way that they produce them. Changes can be quite simple. It might be introducing a legume crop, introducing a cover crop, a green manure, a shift from a spring crop to a winter crop, or vice versa. So, you know, there, there are lots of options to suit lots of different people in, in different parts of, um, in parts of Europe. I've talked mainly today about the proposals in relation to arable cropping um, and, and arable sequences, but in some of the really important tree crops in Southern Europe, so things like fruit or olives, um, legumes can very easily be an understory providing nitrogen and providing biodiversity reservoirs. I think what we really have to think about is what are the long-term gains? Um, it's very easy to get hung up on, on short-term changes in agriculture and of the yield of the crop this year or next year. But I think we, you know, I hope that where cap reform will end up is, is in doing something that has uh, more long-term benefits to European agriculture. We need organisations like SLU and, and SAC and, and, and others in terms of, of helping to make that transition happen and in terms of providing knowledge exchange and giving farmers and, and land users the wherewithal, the knowledge, the understanding to, to change, uh, change rotations and to change cropping systems. And when you look at, uh, you look at changes, how they, how they occur in society, it's often that the early adopters of change are, are very important. And I think we shouldn't forget that in, in organic production systems, rotations are a cornerstone of those production systems. Uh, legumes are very important to organic systems. There's a tremendous amount of knowledge there that can be utilised in a much wider way than it's being utilised now. And similarly, there are lessons in conventional agriculture that can, can go the other way. You know, con consumers are, are interested in buying environmentally friendly food. I'm, I'm constantly impressed in, in supermarkets in this country about the actual uh, ability, uh, availability of, of food produced uh, in an ecological way, much more than there is available in, in the UK. Uh, and you know, that, that is obviously reflecting an interest uh, amongst the consumer. Um, environmental certification schemes might be a part of a future reform of, of the CAP. Um, if, if, if that's a way of changing agriculture. And the last point there about carrots, sticks and sermons. I don't know if you have an equivalent to our expression about carrots and sticks, but you know, you can hold a carrot up and the donkey will come, you can beat him with a stick and you can make him move, or you can just preach at him. Um, and I'm, I'm not trying to preach here. Um, what I've been trying to do is to show you some of the ways in which we think that from the Legume Futures project, that changing agricultural systems through using rotations and through more use of legumes can actually uh, help to change agriculture. Thank you.